Hello and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Concept Show, exclusive to the PAUK Radio Network. I'm your host Paul Rook, as always, and we are joined in the studio tonight by Kerry and Richard. Hello guys. Hello. Hello. How, how have you been this week? Really well, oh. thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sort of good, yeah, pretty good. good week. Brilliant. Brilliant. Rich has been trying out his drone. Yes, I, yes, I, I didn't was, hear about that, yeah. I was round Kerry's last night and uh, I've actually brought myself a drone and I thought, well, I'll take it round and sort of show it off and uh, my flying skills and uh, y- yes, that's all I can say about it. I, I heard yeah. you was trimming a bush with it. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Uh, Kerry had uh, what was left of her ponsetta. Uh, that's half gone, and the and a bunch of flowers she had in the vase. Uh, most of those are uh, half gone now. Yeah, you know, but yeah, it was good. It was okay. fun. Yeah, I'm just waiting for a bunch of flowers to replace the ones he ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, sure very they're funny, in the post. That's all I can say. Boys and their toys. Yeah, well, it's a very very funny scenario. <laughs> I can imagine that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tonight's show is an absolute stonker. I've been after this gentleman for absolute donkeys years, years. It is actually years, um, and finally <laughs> managed to pin him down to come onto a show. He is a prolific author in regards to the paranormal, going through county by county and finding out ghost stories, and publishing his findings. Absolutely fascinating for that. But he is best known for one of the most interesting and violent poltergeist cases the south shields poltergeist now this case is a fascinating um case study and one that i think we would all love to get our grubby little mitts on so please welcome to the studio darren w ritson you know darren hello there <laughs> thank you thank you for um, having me on yeah oh i've been after you for so long Yes, it's um, it's been a long time coming. Um, I remember a few years ago when you first started asking, and I'd been going through a difficult time in my life, and I didn't have anywhere to live. Um, I didn't have internet access, anything like that. So it's just been a bit of a bit of a nightmare getting to to where I am now. But things are looking up, things are better, and um, I'm online. I'm back in the swing of things. I mean, I did actually take a couple of years out because of this um, to get myself sorted. But here I am, back in the fold, and. Um, Rare in the go. Oh, and it's an absolute Brilliant. pleasure to finally pin you down. And Thank glad you that much. you're back in the paranormal saddle, as it were, because it's been a little while. And um, loads of people have been wanting to speak to you, but I've grabbed you. Yes. <laughs> I've yeah. nagged you like a relentless wife, haven't I? <laughs> you, have. you have. You have. I always promised I would do it. And then here we go. Um, man of me word. I got there in the end. Um, IT was a bit of a problem as well. Even when I did get up and running, I find it completely appearing in the backside at times. Because mm-hmm. you know, but but here we go. Here we are. Um, yeah. So <laughs> let's let's break it down. Let's start right back at the beginning. What actually first got you interested in the paranormal and writing in the way you do? Right. Well, as a child growing up, I did experience one or two funny occurrences, what I would deem to have been maybe it's paranormal in nature. Um, starting off at the house where I used to live, um, in the early days, my dad used to tell his stories. Obviously, when I was a little little boy, my dad used to tell his stories in, in bed once upon a time there was. Uh, but unlike um, most bedtime stories, my dad's stories were kind of dark. And he, he would tell us about ghosts and Things like that. Um, so that kind of got us interested. And then after a while, he started telling the stories about the house that I was living in, in the room I used to sleep in and who used to live there and what happened to the, the little boy that used to live in that house. And I was kind of terrified to sort of get out of bed. I don't know if he was up to tricks or anything, you know, to keep us rooted to my bed rather than getting up and about, you know, like what kids do. Mm-hmm. Um but he would tell us these stories about this, this little boy that lived in my room and um, he ended up getting killed, unfortunately, on the railway lines, which were out back of my house. Um, and he said he, he, at times he would hear footsteps pattering around on the on the floor. Uh, whilst I was in bed upstairs, and he would come to the bottom of the, the stairwell and shout, get to sleep, you know, as, as you do. 
And me, myself and my brother, who was in the other room, uh, when he come up to see us, we were, we were fast asleep. Um, so I mean, the, there was there was that story. But later on in life, I actually turned round um, to my dad and I said, "Were you just winding me up, or was there any truth to these stories?" And he said, "No, no, they were actually true stories. Um, I did have odd experiences in the house. That, that's what my dad had said." And he said, I always thought there'd be good stories to tell you um, <laughs> when you were a kid. So it was kind of that sort of thing. And amongst some other things, there was I went to France in 1986 with a school. And we stayed in this old, gigantic, gothic-style building that had old dormitories. You know, Some dormitories had about 20 beds in. Other dormitories had about three or four. Now, I was in one of the dormitories with three or four. And, of course, when you go away with kids at school and you go to these type of places, there's always ghost stories and there's always adventures. If, do you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. everyone was going on about the ghosts and things like that. But it was on the last night. Um, I'd, I'd went to sleep. There was four or five were in this dormitory. Um, during that afternoon, I have to say, um, we'd sneak some drink into the the dormitory which we weren't allowed to do no it wasn't an alcoholic drink it was like actually orange juice but we still weren't allowed to take any food or drink into the dorms but we had took some orange juice up there but i managed to spill some all over the floor now rather than mop it up and tidy it up what we decided to do was pick this huge heavy bedside cabinet up and we lugged it over into the middle of the floor and we just put it on top of this orange juice which was on the floor not thinking for one moment, if the teacher had came in, he would say, what's that What's that doing in the middle of the floor? <laughs> um, kids, you know, we didn't think properly. You, you know what I mean? We didn't think, well, they just tidy it up and the teacher would not say anything. Anyway, we went to bed that night. It was the last night in France. It was in Dieppe. Um, and I woke up to this slow, steady thumping noise. And I opened my eyes and I thought, what on earth's that? And I turned and I looked, and as, as cheesy as this sounds, this it's true. There was like moonlight shining in through the window, and it was illuminating the scene. Um, and I could see this bedside cabinet slowly rocking from side to side. It was coming up on one edge, and then resting onto the floor, making one knock, and then it was lifting up again on its other edge, and then coming back down. So like the, the knocking on was the bedside cabinet as it was making contact with the floor. So I slid my legs over the side of the bed, rubbed my eyes and leant a bit forward to, to get a closer look because I was thinking, what on earth am I seeing here? And as I leant forward to take a closer look, this whole bedside cabinet just took off and it flew across the room. And all my belongings, my French francs that I had left and my keys and all my bits and bats that were on there just scattered throughout the room. Now, in an instant, everybody else in the dorm woke up with choice expletives, you know, they were like, what on earth was that? I jumped up at about a 1,000 miles an hour, ran to put the light on. Um, at this point, I was actually crying with fear because I was I was only about 13 at the time. Um, and that was just astounding. Well, I don't know what it was, and I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, so everybody jumped up, and they were all sort of shaking. Um, and for the rest of the night, we basically sat up, didn't go back to sleep, we left the light on. And we came home the following day, which was quite fortunate because I don't think I could have spent another night in that place. That was my last night there. So it was stories like what my father had told us and the accounts like the one that I had in Dieppe, which really made me think there's something funny is going on here. And I'm going to start sort of looking into this. Um, So that's when I started buying books and magazines back in the 80s. there was a publication out called The Unexplained, which you could get in book format or you can get in magazine format once a month. I started getting them, started reading up about them. And eventually I progressed on to like ghost books. I started reading um, about the Enfield Poltergeist. I started reading about Harry Price and the most haunted house in England, being Bawley Rectory. And from that point, I was gripped, basically. I was like, wow, there's something funny going on here. And... Um, and I'm fascinated by it because what I saw that night defied all sort of logic, really. And that's basically it. That's what got me. That's what got me going. So from there, where did you first take a step into becoming 
an author like writing about this for yourself and or was you investigating before you did that no no i wasn't investigating um at the time what i what i did back in those days in the early days of getting into this sort of field um, I used to just go out and about visiting haunted sites, taking photographs, and my goal at that point was to capture a ghost on a photograph. Um, that, that was what I wanted to do. So I researched all the, the buildings in Newcastle, is where I lived at the time, and I started visiting these sites, reading up about the old, you know, the folklore and all the, the legends and tales of the town. And I started visiting these sites, and I was going inside, and I was taking photographs of them from the outside, and just keeping them for me files, and when I was inside, I was taking photographs of passageways and rooms. And, and I've never done any overnight investigations at that point. Um, but I always used to enjoy going to the camera shop, putting me film in, and I had to wait a couple of days in those in those days before I could get <laughs> me roll back. And then I'd hurriedly rush home, dig out me, me 36 photographs, because um, obviously it was on a roll of film of those days. And, and I would like look through them excitedly, hoping I'd see a a ghost or a or a figure of some sort, but I never did, unfortunately. Um, eventually, I decided to myself, um, I'm going to start a little paranormal society, and this it's quite embarrassing, I suppose, but I called it SISP, which was Special Investigations into Strange Phenomena, and I was the only member. Aww. <laughs> But it was a new little project, if you know what I mean. And mm-hmm. I designed this little front cover for it, and um, it was like in a folder. And I, I designed a front for it. And I, what I decided then to do was like put a questionnaire together: Have you seen a ghost? And you know, where was it? As much detail as possible. And if, if I ever heard anyone talking about a ghost sighting or something weird happening to them, and that included UFOs at the time, I would say to them, "Could you fill in this form, please?" And then. They would fill in the form in as much detail, and then I would file it away after reading it. Uh, after a while, I got quite a few, which I, which I still have to this day, um, filed away there. Um, and after a while, I thought to myself, well, what am I going to do with these? And the idea was, maybe one day I thought to myself, maybe it would be good to write a book about my search for, for ghosts, sort of thing. Um, by then, it was around about the early 1990s, um, I'd been into it for a good couple of years, you know, like backwards, back and forth into like other things, and like as as youngsters do, you know, I was introduced to, um, you know, nights out on the town and ladies and all that sort of stuff. So you know, every now and again, it fell by the wayside. But then I came back to it, and in the early nineties, um, somehow I, I can't remember where I first heard of this chap, but. I discovered an investigator who lived in Scotland called Malcolm Robinson. Now, you, you're probably aware of Malcolm. Yeah, yeah. we've interviewed yeah. him on the show. Yeah, yeah he's right. Lovely chap. And I, I, Somehow I found this address of where he was based in his early days of, oh, what was it called? SPI. SPI. Um, so I sent him a letter and I says, look, I've got these forms and these accounts of what people have claimed to have saw. And I said, I'd like to go into it further. So I asked basically for advice, saying, how do I further research? Is there any points I need to brush up on or like elaborate on to get a, a, a bigger picture of what had been going on? And he basically started sending his correspondence and letters and information on how to research things. So I've, I've got a lot to thank Malcolm Robinson for in the early days because he sort of pointed me in the right direction. Um, so I started doing that when when people were giving us forms i was like going a little bit more in depth and trying to write them up but nothing ever came of it um in in that particular time but it was only a few years later um i was at work and this new lad had started and he told us he was into ghosts and the paranormal which sort of got me oh well i used to be into that i i love paranormal and ghosts and i still do all the reading um, in talking to this lad called Andrew, he sort of got it rekindled within it, and then eventually we started doing what overnight investigations. I think my first investigation was around two thousand and three, um, and I figured I'd had enough not knowledge as such, but I'd had enough basic information to maybe go to a place overnight and start actually looking 
for ghosts myself um, with tape recorders, um, notepads and pens, and basic cameras, 35 millimeter cameras. And that's basically, it, it just went from there. And after I started doing investigations, overnight here, overnight there, again, it was back to pen and paper, and I started writing up the investigations and keeping a detailed note of what happened and what we did at what time and what experiments were carried out. And then it just went from there, basically. And this has become like, so this is a lifelong passion for you. This has been something that you've been introduced to as a young child. And it's kind of understandable how you've got into the storytelling and the documenting different ghost stories in various, you know, books that you've written yeah. from your childhood, you know, from your father. Well, yes, yes, from my father, he got me sort of started into the idea of thinking about ghosts. But when I started reading the books, um, I read a lot of Peter Underwood books as well. You know, he, mm. he was a big influence on me as well in my early days of reading. And I, I loved his style. I loved the way he'd go to different places and he'd write up and he'd talk to inter interview people and find out what had been going on and stuff like that. So uh, a lot of my guides, I suppose, and a lot of my books like the In Search of Ghosts and like the regional guides that I've done around the northeast of England, they're sort of inspired by the works of like Peter Underwood. Um, I guess I tried to sort of emulate him to a certain extent. Um, but yes, uh, I've, I've been into it a, a very, very long time, um, as far back as I can remember, to be honest, which is quite a, 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 a long time. Because I'm I'm getting old now, you see. <laughs> <laughs> you keep saying this. I'm getting old. I'm getting old. It's not that old. old. <laughs> just old now. You're a young whippersnapper of a lad. <laughs> uh, well, fingers crossed. I've got loads of time left. I've touched one. Yeah. Yes, you but, have. But, but, I can, but I can see when I read in search of ghosts I did think at the time this is very sort of Peter Underwood. So you have managed to translate that over quite well. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad. I'm glad because I guess it's a nice little tribute to the man himself. Yeah. Um, and what was more astonishing eventually was that Peter Underwood would become to, he, he would get to read the early books. He had a copy of In Search of Ghosts and Supernatural North and um, he'd, he'd write letters telling us how he thought they were great. And in fact, the Supernatural North book, he actually agreed to pen the foreword for it, which I was absolutely honoured to have and he, he wrote a very complimentary lengthy forward for me Supernatural North book and I thought wow this is this is, this is great <laughs> so uh, yeah <laughs> so along this journey you come across what is oh an absolutely fascinating case the South Shields poltergeist uh, we're going to delve into that quite extensively at this stage because at what point of your your own personal paranormal journey did you come across this case and how this occurred um, a couple of years after I would eventually started doing my first overnight investigations. Like I say, the lad at work, Andrew, had started working about 2001, 2000, no, I think it was 2003 or 2002 or something like that. And it was a few years after that we'd started doing overnight investigations and travelling around. And I was still doing my old style ghost hunting with, with, me, with me forms. I was still getting people to fill in them. But then we were looking for venues overnight places to, to maybe set up a gear and start looking for you know for ghosts and stuff like that um, and eventually people got to know what I was doing and back in those early days there, there wasn't that many people doing it well from the 90s there was, there was only about five or six paranormal teams I think in the whole of the UK um, independent from the likes of the SPR and the ghost club and things like that um, so basically by about 2006, people had got to know what I was doing and they thought I was crackers. They were saying, oh, you, you must be nuts going out looking for stuff like this. And I was sitting at my desk one day at work and my line manager at the time, she went off on a lunch break and she met a friend. And when she came back, she came straight back to my desk and she went, my friend's daughter's got a ghost. And I looked and I thought, oh, that's a, that sounds interesting. I went, who's your friend? And she went on to tell me who it was and this was the mother of, of Marianne who's the main experience in the book mm -hmm. and I said well could you tell us a little bit more about it but me, me line manager then gave us the email address to, for the mother so I then sent her an email and I says oh you know I'm, I'm 
Darren, I work on Leslie's team. Leslie was my line manager. And I says, just told us that you know someone who's got a ghost, your daughter. And then we started corresponding, sending emails and messages. And I corresponded with her for a short while. And eventually she said, look, you'd, you'd better contact my daughter, Marianne. And I said, right. So I did. So I contacted her and I says, your mum says I should contact you because you're looking for help. I says, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'll try and offer what help I can at this at this time. And if I remember rightly at that time, I just said, I'm not coming straight away. Um, you can just tell us what's been going on. And I tried to explain from what you told us, it, it sounded pretty much like, um, like a poltergeist. And I was thinking to myself, well, poltergeists are relatively short-lived. Usually, mm-hmm. they've got like a, a short lifespan. So I basically just tried to encourage her and say, look, it's likely it's not going to last for long. Try and bear with it. If you can, keep a note of what's going on, you know, with times and, and dates and the event, what you've experienced, Yeah, you know. I basically keep a diary of events, which she agreed to do. And I say, I'll, I'll call you every now and again. And if, if you need any help, he has me number and you can call me. And that's basically how it how it started. Um, so for a couple... Think- Sorry to interrupt you at that point. No, 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 that's all right. Now, considering you're, and I don't mean disrespect by this, but you're quite inexperienced in the investigation mm-hmm. side. You've got a lot of knowledge there from the reading and, and the work you've done. But yeah. in regards to investigation sides at this stage, you're very quite, I'd say, green around the gills, uh, really. Indeed. Just doing, you know, overnight yeah. investigations. And just sort of like, you've dealt with this, how we would all recommend now, in this day and age, how we would, yeah. you know, you would recommend that. That's very foresighted of you um, to get the diary and, and, you know, mark it down and just perform the reassurance rather than rushing in there mm-hmm. to do an investigation. The temptation to be um, hands on with a real life and kicking poltergeist, as it were, must have been such a temptation. Yeah, it was. When, when, when I was being informed about what was going on at the house, I was sort of getting quite excited, thinking to myself, goodness me, if, if this is. If, if this is true, um, then this potentially could be a live poltergeist infestation. Um, in relation to the advice that I sort of given her, that basically kind of came from uh, the late Morris Gross. I've watched interviews about Enfield and I'd, I'd seen him do interviews on TV. And he come across as a very knowledgeable individual as well. So he was saying things like, become the investigator, try not to become frightened. It, it, at that point, they were saying it could be stress-related, so the more that you get stressed out, the stronger this poltergeist might get. So Morris's advice at the time was become the investigator. If you want things to happen, your stress levels will go down. If you get excited when you see something, you jot it down, it's another addition to your diary. And the more you become into it, the more you become the investigator as opposed to being the victim, the likelihood is, yes, stress levels will deplete because of it, and it might sort of then peter out. And mm-hmm. them sort of words that Morris had said sort of struck a chord, and I was like thinking, wow, that that could be true. So that's the kind of advice I started giving Marianne. Um, in relation to the actual going in and, the in, in and actually investigating it, I thought to myself in the early days, I could be a bit over my head with this, um, no, I felt confident that I could have went in and, and tried to help, but that's where my good friend Mike Hallowell came in, you see. He'd been around and he'd been on the scene for, for about 30 years at that point, investigating ghosts, and he, he used to do uh, conferences and paranormal speaking across the country, and he'd been doing it for years. And I met him if, a year or two earlier at, uh, what was it? It was a... Uh, the Paranormal Research Society had this open day where people could go along and see what they did. So I went along that day, and that's when I met Mike for the first time. And then I subsequently became involved with this Paranormal Research Society, which started out in in Newcastle City Centre. And when this case came along, the first thing I thought to myself was, I don't want to go and investigate this on my own. I'm, I'm going to need some like backup, basically, as well. So... I figured Mike would be a great person to ask. So when the two got my heads together and I told him about it, he said, it sounds too good to be true. And I says, Mike, it really does. But if we get invited when we go in, do you want to come in with me? And, and he said yes. So 
there we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you're following up, you know, you're, you're talking to the client, or called, you know, Marianne, and uh, she's doing this diary. What sort oh. of entries were in the diary that she was writing? Right, basic things at first, little things going missing and then suddenly reappearing. Um, doors being found open when they knew they had closed them. Objects being found in the bath, for example. Uh, taps being left on. Um, just things like that for a while. It was, it, it was very slow progressing to start, which was would have been December of 2005. Um, and basically... Mark and Marianne were blaming each other for, for like, you've left the door open, you've left this unlocked. No, it wasn't me, it must have been you. You know, little things like that. Why would you why would you leave these things in the bath? And it's like, you know, you've left the tap on. What you know, turn the tap off, stop being so careless. And they kind of blamed each other at first for the for the minor little things that were occurring. Then it sort of sort of ramped up uh, to a degree where they started thinking, hang on. It's it's not you. It's not. It, and then they started experiencing things for themselves. You know, like doors would then close on them, and other things like objects would just clatter onto the floor, and toys would be thrown about. And that's when they started getting a little bit concerned. And that I think it was that point they realised. You know, one was thinking, "This isn't me, other half being careless," and the the other half was saying, "No, this isn't me, other half being careless." There's something dodgy potentially going on here. And it had went on a good while before we were even thought about, to be honest. Um, you see, it started in the December of 2005, and I, I wasn't contacted or told about the case until June 2006. <clears throat> um, but by that point, it had been going on for about five or six months, and it was slowly, progressively getting getting a little bit worse. There was okay. one incident where... yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you again. What's the setup of the family? So we know that there's Mariana and Mark. Is, is is there anybody else living in the house? Yes, they had. A, Marianne had a son who was three years old at the time, who we named Robert in the book. He was just a, a, a tiny little three-year-old, lovely little happy-go-lucky kid who, to everything to him, the water was just water off a duck's back. To be honest. But there was the, th the three of them were living there, yeah. And their relationship? Was it a good relationship, a stressful relationship? Was there an abusive relationship? Was there any kinds no. of, you know, any, any of those kind of indicators in there? No, 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 no nothing like that. Um, Mark and Marianne loved each other dearly. And um, although Robert was Mark's stepson, um, the, the family all, all, all gelled and they, they were... A, just a nice little happy family. Um, so, you, so we're talking like a nice normal, yeah, fa a nice normal family. No, no problems, no medical problems, no, uh, you know, addiction problems. There's nothing like that that you would normally look for, is there? Well, at that point, we didn't think there was, but as we delve further into the case, certain events came to light, shall we say, which um, sort of kind of highlighted certain things which made us think it made us kind of point the finger at one of these individuals which we, we, we it was Mark basically we we decided he's the focus by judging by what we eventually learned about what had been going on um, he'd been he, he had experienced a hard time he'd been going through a little bit of a hard time with, with certain things I'm, I'm trying hard not to like give too much away to be honest yeah yeah so, no I don't so blame you we like... want people to go and read the book as well <laughs> yeah. well, there's, well there's lots of stuff in the book that explains why we think it could be it could have been more but there's things that have been left out of the book which were a little too no we shouldn't really be putting that in um, right. even though they eventually went anonymous originally they were going to be named in the book it, it, it's, it's a really complicated story anyway some of the some of the finer details the more personal, private stuff were left out, but at the, at the, in the early stages, um, when, whenever I knew any of this, and in relation to the the, the family unit, the, the group, um, there was nothing untoward going on there, and they all loved each other dearly, and they were they were a happy, normal family, so to speak. 
So when you came in in the June of the 2006, this has gone on for a, uh, for a good few months. The strain that it must have put on their relationship must have been quite strong. Yes, yes. Um, they were more frightened than anything else. Um, I think the strain might have came in the early days when they were blaming each other for this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there may have been a few arguments break out. It wasn't me. And, well, well, you know, it must have been you because what's going on? Mm-hmm. Eventually, when they realised something must be going on, I think that they, they stopped blaming each other as much, and they were more sort of confused and bewildered as to like, what is it? What is it? We've got a ghost. There's something going on in the house. Now, in the early days as well, before we got involved, there had been a number of people involved in the case. Like there was a local spiritualist church went in, um, and they went in. And they did the usual thing. Yeah, you, you've got a man on the landing upstairs, and somebody in your bedroom, and at the bottom of the stairs, you've got two people here in your living room. You've got old George who lived down the street, and you've got a ghost of a, a dog, a cat, and a goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, and after the day they'd spent there, they went right. That's it. We've got to go and buy, and off they went, and they left them more terrified than what they were before they came, and they didn't come back. They basically said, um, you've got a number of evil spirits here and um, we'll, we'll do something to try and get rid for you. And they, they weren't never seen again, to be honest, um, which kind of stressed the family out. And different different parts throughout the early stages as well, like Marianne's family would come and visit and they never believed her at first. They, they were finding, they were having a bit of trouble getting the family members to believe what was going on. And eventually um, they started seeing stuff for themselves, which I eventually found out about and it was, you know, they'd written it all down. Um, and it got to a point one day where I received a telephone call and it was Marianne and she says, look, I know you said it would go away. But see, by this time it had been going for about five or six months. And I'm thinking, well, that's that's quite long, very long for the, for the average poltergeist. Yeah. And so I was saying to him, I'm saying, look, it's it's been flexing its psychic muscles for a long time now. It has to. If it's a poltergeist, and that's what I think it is, it has to burn itself out sooner or later. It's got to be able to just fizzle out and go. But it just didn't seem to be doing that. It just seemed to be getting more intense as each day went by. And eventually she phoned me up and she went, look, you're going to have to come in. She went, it's been going on a while now. I want you to come in. I want you to say stuff. I want you to to confirm that we are not going absolutely crack us yet because we've had people in and we've never seen them come back um, half the time up until that point you know, my, my parents didn't believe what I was telling them until they saw something for themselves now we know something odd is going on could you please come across and have a look and I was like okay we'll, we'll come over so we made an appointment or a, or a date to which we'd go over and that's when I contacted Meg and I said look I've got this case. Um, I was telling you about it. The vast, if I would like to go in, would, would would you come in with us just for a little bit of backup, a little bit of support? Mm. And he said, "Yes, yeah, sure thing." And that was in the ju- July of two thousand and six. Yeah, that's when we went in for the first time. And what were your impressions when you first walked into that house? Well, I remember it being a blistering hot summer's day. We were absolutely sweltering. It was a, the whole country was baking in a huge heat wave at that point. Um, so we went in. We got off at a, a lovely cup. Hello, nice to meet you. We did the usual introductions and that. And would you like a drink, a cup of tea? And I was like, no, thank you. Even though tea's quite refreshing, I have to admit. We asked for a nice glass of water. So we got a nice glass of water. We sat down, and um, basically it was Mike who carried out the interview he started chatting with the family and you know my eyes were like you know darting across the rooms we were trying to look for like you know like books on ghost paranormal see if there was any clues we we're looking for crucifixes on walls see if there were you know, if, see what information we could get without asking them to see if they were into the paranormal because if you investigate somebody's house that's into the paranormal they'll often tell you what the cause is before you've even started doing that because they've got these preconceived ideas we were looking to see if they were into the paranormal, anything like that. And there was nothing in the house that would give away any sort of clues like that. No crosses, no crucifixes um, hanging up on the walls, no ghost books, 
anything like that. So it seemed clear that they weren't into the paranormal at all, whatsoever. So when Mike was carrying out the interviews, eventually I, I stood up and I says, look, I've got a few little bits of equipment. I've got some motion sensors and a video camera. Um, I says, with all due respect, if this is as exciting, stroke, frightening as what you claim it is, I really want to get some camera set up just in case something happens. So they said, yes, by all means. So I went upstairs. This is where, in the early point in the investigation, that it seemed to be centred around Robert's room upstairs in, in the top floor landing. So I went up there and I set some gear up. And then Mike was basically doing the in, the interviews. Um, and it, it, that day was just an exciting day. I just, to be honest, it, that, that was the day that sort of changed my way of thinking forever. All the way until that point in my life, I was always sceptical on the fence when it comes to poltergeist activity. I, I thought back to my incident in France and I thought, well, I saw that in France, so there's no reason why these things can't be happening. I, I didn't have an explanation for what went on in France with, with the bedside cabinet. So it was... The, that was in the back of my mind saying, well, I know these things can happen, so could they be happening in this house? And again, after reading like the Enfield Poltergeist book, I'd read a lot of the things in there and i think, nah, 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 not having this, not having this. <laughs> but then I thought about it, yeah, yeah, just maybe, got to keep an open mind. I'm fascinated. And it was like so many other cases in the records, in the archives, dating back in history, which, which claim the same activity, claim the same type of things and I'm thinking, well, surely not everybody who's ever experienced poltergeist phenomena, they, they can't all be making it up, they can't all be something's got to be in it mm. um, so yeah uh, the, the, the hope was that afternoon we would actually see some action for ourselves um, and we did that was, that was, that was quite eye-opening and when we left that day, we were absolutely gobsmacked, mouth, you know, when your jaw just drops and you're like, oh my goodness me, <laughs> this is real. Um, so, yeah. So, what happened on your first visit? This is the first visit, everybody remember, to the house. This yes. Is, you know, up yeah. to now, it's all been correspondence. This is your first visit to the house. Um, you come across a very amiable couple with a really cute kid. Nothing seems untoward. You know, you've you've sort of crossed the, you know, the T's and dotted the I's in regards to keeping an eye out. You know, trying to find, get a vibe. You know, what's going on? Is it a most haunted in the front room kind of thing that they want? <laughs> and then something actually happens. Yes, what well, happened? It was, it was about four hours into one afternoon. There, um, most of the time during. That, that first day, it was quiet. We were basically just getting to know the couple and, um, you know, having a bit banter with them, having a, having a bit crack, trying to put them at ease. And on that very first day, we, we assured them that um, if this is real, we're not just going to leave today and then not come back if nothing happens. We'll, we'll stay with it. We'll stick with it. We, we genuinely believe you. But however, we would like to see something for ourselves. We need, we need confirmation that you're not pulling my leg here because there's a lot of lies and leg pulling can go on. Um, a lot of people wind people up for whatever motives they've got. I d we don't know why, but that's always in the back of your mind. Um, so anyway, it was about three, four hours into the afternoon. Um, we decided to all traips upstairs. Nothing had happened most of that day. We went upstairs into Robert's bedroom and we were just standing about and we're just chatting normally, um, just having a bit of a conversation going into details about this happened and, and that happened and oh I was terrified and the, you know really in some incidences to it when all of a sudden um, this little yellow plastic nut which was part of Robert's little toy toolkit he had nuts and you know nuts and bolts and little plastic spanners he'd, he'd make things with them and that um, and this little toolbox it was, he had this little yellow plastic nut that was in there and it just fired across the room from nowhere in a blink of an eye it it pinged off the back wall and it hit the wall so hard or sorry it hit the like a recess cupboard door and then it bounced off the door and it struck Marianne on the backside and she absolutely winced she jumped lunged forward and you know grabbed the back of her leg and she went oh 
And I'd seen something out the corner of my eye, like flitting across, but it, it all happened within a split second, a millionth of a second. And we were like, oh my goodness me, something's, something's been thrown around. And whilst we were like recovering from that sort of thing, like, well, I was standing, yeah, I was standing. And there's his toy box in the corner there. There's, you know, that's, that's where it must have came from. It mm-hmm. darted across the room and hit her. Whilst we were sort of discussing that excitedly, this this goal, and, and another toy goal, which was sitting on the shelf, just slid across the shelf. And it fell into this tin basket, it's like a, a bin. And it, and it landed with a clatter. So then a case would, would, would like, goodness me, something else has occurred. And all in, the, in all of this hullabaloo, it was like keeping your eyes on the on the cobble. I had my eyes on Mike. Mike had his eyes on me. We both had the eyes on the cobble because we're, we're trying to like realize, you know, if something's going on and we're being taken for a radio, we want to be able to catch them out if if they were doing anything. But it, it was clear that they didn't do anything. We had our eyes on them, and this thing slid off the bench and landed in 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 the bin with with a clatter. So we were getting excited about that. Um, so there was two things that, that that happened there. Later on in in the bedroom, um, Mark and Marianne had sat down on the bed, and then out of the blue, Mark just jumped up. Um, I mean, he nearly went through the roof. To be honest, he jumped up mm-hmm. and he said, "This has just appeared next to us," and it was like a little like rubber ball. And to the best of one knowledge, there was nothing on the bed when they sat down. The room had sort of been tidied up, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I picked this ball up, it was actually quite hot to the touch. So there was a number of things that had happened on that first day, which really opened our eyes. And when me and Mike went away that day, we were like. But could it have been them? Could it have done this? And we had to examine every possibility and every scenario of how they could have potentially started flinging things around themselves. And we couldn't, for the life of us, think how they could have done it themselves. But as it transpires anyway, um, it, it progressed even worse and it, it, it got worse and worse as time went by. And over the, the coming months, we got to see some of the most hairiest and Poltergeist activity you could ever wish to see. It was it's it's changed my life. Do, do you know when you start talking about these things, and when I think back about the early days of that investigation, I, I still get hairs on my arms going up, yeah. and I still get lumps in my throat and my eyes fill with water because it's like, wow, it's it's just mind blowing. It is one yeah. of those. It is one of those um, situations where you can't quite believe it. But even if it's happening in front of your eyes, you're just like, did that really happen? How did yes. you break that? You yes. know, it's one of those, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, we were standing like gobsmacked because even though we'd been told this is going on here, there was always doubts in my mind. It's, it's, yeah, it's too good to be true. They always are. Nine times out of ten, you'll go to a, uh, an alleged poltergeist plagued house and you come away with nothing happening and then it always comes to nothing. And... I never thought in a million years that just one of these times we would go to this house and all hell would just completely break loose. I mean, there was other things happened on that day as well. Um, other toys being thrown around. The, the yellow nut was flicked around again. Things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was an eye-opening time, if you know what I mean. When we went, when, when, when we left <coughs> that day... We were sitting on the bus because I wasn't driving back in those days. But we were sitting on the bus heading back to Mike's and we were just like, wow, <laughs> what the hell just happened there? And we were like, well, it, 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 it's got to be, it's too, you know, we were thinking it's too good to be true. We were thinking, well, actually, had on, something could be actually going on here. Yeah. We need to have a think about this. So we, obviously we went away and we said, look, keep in touch. Keep the diary notes coming. If you don't mind, that, that would be a, a great help so we can document exactly what's going on and then we're going to evaluate it and then if it gets any frightening, any more intense, give her a call, we'll, we'll come back. And it just basically went from there. Okay, boys, <laughs> we've been very quiet in the background there, you two. But, yeah, <laughs> listen listen yeah. intensely. It, it's a plot spoiler for the book because I've only just started reading it. And, um, <laughs> I've only, I've only done chapter one at the moment, and that's as far as like um, 
you, you've got the emails going backwards and forwards from you and um, the client. And, yeah. you know, it, it goes into more in-depth because obviously you've just briefly skimmed over what, what was said. But obviously the, the full emails and stuff with within reason in the book. Um, and, yeah, it, as you said, it was just a case of you, did, you didn't want to go in there all guns blazing sort of thing. And I, I thought that was quite good. Um, but, yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing the rest of it. Um I, I did have a flick through at some of the pictures and stuff that you took, um, and I noticed there was a, quite a similarity to one of the cases I worked on quite a few years ago. Uh-huh. Um, so that sort of piqued my interest a little bit more. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading the rest of the book. Right. Which which version have you got, mate? I ask. Is it the hardback? Uh, it's, it's the, it's the um, paperback. It's the mod, the the, uh, the latest one. Um, oh, right. Yeah, I only bought it last week, I think. When I, when I found out you was going to be on, so I thought, oh, I'll read, I'll read um, Sam Shields' poll, guys. But because I've got work and everything, it's it's a bit yeah. um, difficult to, you know, just pick it up and read it for days on end. But it's, it's one of those books that you could quite easily do that. Um, it's just work gets in the way, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I know that feeling. I know that feeling. But I'm, I'm glad it's that one you've picked up because obviously that's got some updates in. Not in relation to the actual story. Yeah. However, there is one chapter which I decided to include, um, which never sort of went into the first one, and that's something to do with when the poltergeist began to follow them to their workplace. At that particular time, they didn't want to mention their workplace or have their workplace yeah. talk about just in case it had repercussions. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they didn't really know how their boss might react once things started going off of it. So... For them, we, we, we admitted that chapter, but then I, I rewrote it and added to it, and I put it yeah. into the new book because it had been uh, 15 years, well, actually 15 years, in fact, 15 years ago to this day, um, it would have been going on, that they would have been in the early stages of it beginning. Yeah. Uh, so I figured 15 years later, it, it might be okay to put the, the new chapter in. And then there was a few updates I wanted to add, like, um, what was it? There was a review done for the Society for Psychical Research by Alan Murray, and that went into the the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, and that was in 2010. And I had Alan's permission to reproduce his critique of the case and of the book, um, which illustrates the fact that he's viewed the evidence and he's looked at the evidence and he's evaluated it, because um, a lot of people claim we well, haven't got any. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but in relation to the evidence, it's 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 very, with with keeping the family anonymous, mm. you've got to, we've got to be very careful not to compromise their anonymity, well, and I think it. that comes first and foremost over anything. I would I would happily now, be sure that the case is fraud, or fixed or fake simply because. Some people demand to see the evidence. Mm. We see it, then people we're, we're not going to show you. Be nice about it. And we say things like, well, we've, we've got to be careful. People were going on about the documentary that was going to be made. We had three documentary made, like filmmakers, make the documentaries. But then they eventually wanted the family. But because we wouldn't give the family up to these filmmakers, they said, well, we might have to shelve it. So we were like, well, unfortunately, mm. you can, you're just going to have to shelve it then because mm. we're not going to give up the anonymity. If you go knocking on the door, they're just going to slam the door in your face anyway. Yeah. So we're going to lose any credibility we have, and you're still not going to get your documentary made. But they did they did say they could have made the documentary with us telling the story with a little bit of footage included. There was certain amounts of footage released to newspapers at the time. This was after the case and round about the time the book was coming out. We figured it... I mean, it's not a money-making thing, but we figured it would do the book good if... Mm the publicity in relation to the case came around about the time when the book came out. So we want the story to be told, and the best way to do that is get publicity for it. So that's yeah. what we did. Yeah. And other people have said, well, how come we haven't seen newspaper articles, and how come there wasn't people from the media there experiencing stuff? And why haven't we... Because normally in Poltergeist cases, you normally get media turning up, and it's, it becomes a circus, and that was the last thing we wanted. Mm. Um and to be honest as well, we gave full control of what was happening 
And what we were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do, we give the family full, full control over that. And we said, we will do nothing that you don't want me to do. Yeah. If you don't want these people involved, we'll not tell them. And they were like, well, I don't want media involved. I didn't want, I, I don't want the house to become a big circus like a lot of the cases have done, mm. which is what we know. Um, so that's why we kept the media at bay. When, at the time of the infestation, we hardly told us so that was going on. Um, eventually, it got to a point where I said to Mike, look, we're going to have to bring some people in because there's stuff happening all over the place and there's only mine and your word for this as well as you know the family and what little bit of footage we've accumulated. We need witness testimony. So that's when we eventually started bringing colleagues in and, and people to say stuff for themselves. And all them, testament, all them statements are at the back of the book. And there's even one from... Um, there was a colleague of mine at the time who I used to work quite closely with, David Wood. He was the the president of of the chairman of ASAP, the, yeah. the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Association for the Scientific. Uh, <laughs> we'll right. just call it ASAP. We can never get it right. <laughs> <laughs> but him and, him and his, his his lady friend, who was um, high up in in the, the association anyway. Nikki Sewell, I believe she was called, um, invited them up and they come all the way up from Swindon and they, they spent a day there and his statement's in the back of the book. Now, granted, his statement is a lot more academic and scientific as opposed to the rest of them, um, but he's, he's seen some pretty hair-raising stuff and it's pretty much, if, if you read his statement, it, it tells you what he saw, but there's, he hasn't committed himself to say things like, wow, it was amazing, it was great. He hasn't. He hasn't left himself wide up in the way we have. I'm. I'm not frightened to put my heart on me on my sleeve. I'll nail my flag to the mask and say, "Yeah, I saw this, and I don't care what anybody thinks. This happened. Believe yeah. it. Don't believe it. I know the truth." Um, yeah. But many, many times when you have an experience for any any of us out there, um, when you relate it back, it is. It's one of those like I can't believe that happened. Yourself, you know what happened. You know the circumstances, the people involved, the, the environment, you know, the vibe, all of that, you know. And you tell somebody else and you think, God, this sounds crazy. It isn't because you've lived it. You know that experience. You don't have to justify that. And we've talked many, many times on this show about keeping an open mind, you know, and not being closed minded It's very easy to be dismissive, mm -hmm. um, which you could have been very dismissive when you first came across this case. Yeah. Um, you know, and reading the accounts, you could be thinking, oh, well, yeah, right. You yeah, know, okay. Like you say, too good to be true. It usually mm. is. But on this occasion, it wasn't. Well, yeah. I think if you, if you look at Guy Playfair's introduction to the book, he, he states pretty much the same thing. Um, what, what he actually says is this happened, that happened, you know, it, but it can't happen because things like this just doesn't happen, does it? And then he's put, uh, but, but yes, it does. There's there's a lot that conventional science doesn't know. We haven't got all the answers to all the questions. Reality is not what we think it is presently. And this is yet another case which illustrates a number of things, i.e. that the fact that those words are, are true. We don't know the answers. I mean, there's something distinctly weird going on I mean, the poltergeist can do some absolutely fantastic, amazing tricks that it's got in its repertoire. Some amazing feats. It, it beggars belief. Mm. It, it gets me speechless sometimes. I sit and I think <laughs> and I scratch my head and I think, wow, <laughs> what on, you know? So Guy more or less said the same thing. Saying, but it also doesn't conform, oh. does it? That's, right? that's, that's the other interesting thing is it doesn't conform when you you know when we look at poet guys cases we go oh is there a teenager in the house or a menopausal woman in the house or <laughs> is there like trauma going on in the house you know it this isn't actually looking like it's conforming to what our preset belief systems are in regards to how a poltergeist should man or why it would manifest in the first place this yeah. is like you know when you start looking at this case it's not as easy to dismiss because it isn't conforming yeah yeah, but that, that's one of the things we kind of thought of earlier on um, when when we went in. We, we looked around and we thought, "Where's the teenager here? 
Where, where's yeah. this young girl who's just about to, or has just started reaching like puberty? This is normally the case. What? What? Why? Why isn't there somebody here? So that got me thinking. And there's there's a couple of other cases. There was a great poltergeist case in the in the nineties, investigated by John and Anne Spencer, where it was like a middle aged couple and they didn't have any children at all whatsoever. So these cases are noticeable by the absence of the, the, the young teenager in this case. This is what makes them stand out and think, well, all these exceptions to the norm, if you know what I mean, the exceptions mm-hmm. to the rule, that's normally nine times out of ten you've got the young disturbed adolescent, but in this case there wasn't. So we were kind of scratching our heads in, we were thinking, well, what's going on here? So it must be somebody else. We figured, like, well, there must be another potential focus who's at the epicenter of this. So we then had to try and work out who it was. And it wasn't Robert. It wasn't the young stuff. No way, not in a million years. Because at that time, he was, like I said earlier, water off a duck's back there. And a lot of the stuff was happening and he was just giggling and laughing. He wasn't stressed out in any way, shape or form. He was just being a three-year-old. Um, yeah. But there was, there was times when the poltergeist sort of lean towards him if you know what I mean and it sort of focused its attention on him it, it it moved him out of his bed a couple of times it wrapped him up in a blanket and stuffed him under a table um, but he, he wasn't aware of any of this at the time um, and it, it got particularly like frightening um, yeah wow wow <laughs> it's yeah. almost like the, hearing you talk about it it's like you still can't believe that you landed in the middle of this situation. I, I can't. I still can't to this day. I'm, I see I see other people, they read books, and then sometimes they'll, they'll put a chapter in on South Shields, and there's, there's high highfalutin members of like the SPR who, who've said, you, you did a good job there. Wow. You know, um, Guy Line Playfair um, actually said to me, he went. This this is up this is up up here with Enfield. This he went. This is absolutely magnificent case, and I, you could have just blew me away with a feather or knocked me down with a feather, whatever. And I was like, and I, I said to the guy, I went, could you put that on tape? <laughs> 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 and I was like, I really need some document, that, you know. But he was he was like sitting going through the manuscript and looking at what evidence because we went down to London to see him because he wanted to write the forward for the book, you know. Um. And wow, yeah. I mean, did this happen? <laughs> did this happen? I often lie awake at night. I mean, fifteen years on, it's like pinch me. Not many people in my in my mind, in my head. I mean, the paranormal world is overrun now by billions. Everybody's interested, and everybody's got a place within the paranormal world. Everybody's entitled to have a, a passion. Everybody's intent. So I'm not going to be nasty about anybody, but there is millions of people in there, out there, and it kind of. I've often thought like the amount of cases that gets reported these days. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases and poltergeists, and there's books galore. There's thousands of books. Back in May Day when I first started, I'd be lucky to get a handful of books on poltergeist cases. Now, now that like that busting off the shelves is that many of them, and I think to myself. I don't know. This is this is, is it, it can be quite controversial. I think like could this the social this poltergeist case, what I deem to be like a genuine bona fide case, even the likes like you say Alan Moody, Guy Playfair, Steve Parsons have all turned around and said this is up with Enfield. This I'm thinking to myself that they're not my words. That's theirs. Mm. I'm thinking could my case be be getting lost in a sea of rubbish, shall we say, mm. because. Not not, I would say ninety percent of those other people that have written or whatever have never experienced true poltergeist activity. Well, I, 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 this is where it gets. I'm, I'm trying to be as fair as I can because there's a lot of books out there I probably haven't read which are genuine, good stories. And who am I to turn around and say it? Your books are rubbish and my book is real. I, I can't say that because I get upset when people say my book's rubbish because I know it's real. So I don't want to belittle anybody's efforts. Anybody who's wrote a book on anything like that gets me full admiration and respect totally. But 
it's a case of so many cases. See, like for one example, me and Mike were doing a talk and we thought that the South Shields Party Gates case was pretty special. And we were talking about the scratches because Mark, on a number of occasions, got literally torn to pieces by this thing in front of her. And we've, we've got it on film. I know people are going to want to see the film, but again, it's like, because if we show anybody this film, we're identifying who he is. Now, I had a word with one of the SPR uh, committee members, and I was talking about submitting the footage for, for evidence, like submitting the lot. And he said, but you've got to submit it full on. He said, you, you cannot edit it before you, you sort of hand it in. And I'm saying, but we need to, we could blank out their faces. He says, but yes, but people will then say, you've edited the footage, you've docked at it, so what else have you docked at? Mm, so it's yeah. a catch 22 situation. We've got this mm. evidence, we've got poltergeist scratches. He, he takes his top off, and there's about five or six cameras on this guy, and he just comes out in these cuts, and it's absolutely horrendous. And there's all that stuff we've also got on tape as well. I mean, the bottle balance, balance footage is quite phenomenal in itself, which, I mean, we've took a lot of stick for that as well. There's been well, lot- on that note, we've actually come to the end of the first half of the show, so hold that thought. Holding. We're going to come back right Holding. after this. Hello, Harry Price here. If there's nothing me and my friends enjoy more here on the other side, it is to sit back and relax and listen to the Paranormal Concept Show right here on the PA UK radio network. Broadcasting a plethora of interesting and informative content for all your paranormal needs. Find them across social media to keep up to date with forthcoming shows and all their other adventures. Hello, is there anybody there? And welcome back to the second half of the Paranormal Concept Show on exclusive to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Now, before the break, we've heard some incredible um, information about the South Shields poltergeist um, from Darren Ritson. And we're going to carry on a little. We can't just skirt that. that that's just not going to happen. Sorry, folks, but there's not. you're going to have to buy the book for the full story. But... We want to explore that a little bit further. Now, this particular podcast has gone on for a longer time than, than normally happens. It's not um, reacting in the normal way that we would normally put parameters on poltergeist activity. And it takes a really sinister turn um, as well, doesn't it? It becomes quite violent at times. I mean, you've already talked about Mark's um, scr- the scratches that appeared on his back. I mean, we see these in the paranormal field all the time, but these are extortionately Oh, these are bad, aren't they? Yes, yes. These were these were quite quite horrendous. And actually, the first night that occurred, um, I wasn't actually there. I was at home, tucked up in bed, and it was Mike that got phoned out. And he got in a taxi and went down. Um, basically, they'd, they'd, they'd been lying in bed, the two of them, and cuddly toys were being thrown around, and you know, they were playing tug of war with the blankets and stuff like that. And um, we were getting bombarded with kids toys and it wasn't letting them go to sleep basically um, and all of a sudden Mark jumped up and he went I'm, I feel like I'm burning like my me, me body's burning so Marianne had said well give us a look so he lifted his t-shirt up and took his top off and he, he, he just appeared in these like cuts and welts that like appeared on his body and they were like angry red things you know to the point where they started bleeding so as you would expect, Marianne was beside herself, so she called Mike, and he, he came down straight away and, and had a look. And whilst they were talking about it, and taking these, he was taking photographs and you know finding out what, what had went on. Um, Mark had put his, his top back on, and they were having a bit of discussion, and he said, "Oh, it's happening again." So uh, off came the top, and Mike got his his film camera out. It was a little <clears throat> little camera, little you know, the little tiny things. It wasn't like a big video camera that Meg had had. It was a It's like a little camcorder. Camera, little point and press camera. Um, oh, right. had a video clip facility on it. So he, he got that out and he, he, he started filming these cuts as they started appearing. Now granted, I have to be honest, uh, the, that footage is quite appalling, <laughs> i.e. 
the quality is rubbish. It really is. But I've always said, if you've got a decent working set of eyes in your head and you can see what's going on, you can see his body and you can see you can see the cuts appearing. Mm-hmm. That that footage was slated simply because it was quite grainy. Fair dues. But if you've got to be honest with yourself, and like I say, you've got these eyes in your head, look and see what's what's actually going on. Look past the quality of the footage, and you, you can still see that these scratches are appearing. Um, as it transpired anyway, he was cut again on a number of other occasions where we did film it in, you know, with decent video cameras. It wasn't just the fo- uh, it wasn't just the camera that that make it hard. There was other video cameras, a whole different range of video cameras, trained on them when, so, you know, in other times. So I woke up the following morning, and Mike had left a message for us, so I, I rang him back, and he was like, you you, you really cannot believe what happened last night. Um, and he went on to explain what was going on. He went, it's actually starting attacking him now. It's starting attacking him. I was like, oh, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. And I was, Why didn't you ring us? I could have got it. See, I lived on the other side of the water at the time in North, North Fane side. Um, and I was like, oh, I was like, upset that I missed it. Um, I guess, well, I hope um, you stayed and, you know, was your shoulder for them, if you, you know, and you say, yes, he, he stayed the rest of the night. Um, and if I remember rightly, that was the same night. Now, didn't quote us on this. I think that was the same night when the bottle was seen on its edge and he filmed the bottle balance footage as well. Um, so that that was like a an, 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 an bit of an incredible night for me, but unfortunately I missed it. Now these are not, we're not talking just like finger scratches, we're not talking fingernail scratches, we are talking deep, like you said, they're like, they're, well, they're deep, they're, they're big, aren't they? They're not Yeah, 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 they must have been about, oh, I mean, they were on... On, on his side, on his torso, on his lower back, his chest, which was absolutely like, it, it looked like something out of a slasher movie, like Freddy Krueger had got to work on him, sort of thing. And the, the, the fascinating thing was, was in the space of a few hours, not one trace remained of these cuts and welts. They're, they're just, they paranormally disappeared as as the paranormally appeared, if you know what I mean. Mm. You know, if you cut yourself and you scratch yourself, just say, for example, you know, Mike looked away and he was trying to, like, fake these cuts and he had nails and he cut himself. If you cut yourself to pieces like that, normally with your fingernails, it's going to take at least a week or two for them to heal up. Mm. Normal, genuine cuts. But these seem to just disappear within hours. Um, but yeah, Mike had phoned and explained about it and I was, I was quite upset at the fact that I'd missed it. But, like I say, later on in the investigation, it happened again, and we were all there to see it. I think there was about 10 or 11 of us all together. We all went and spent the night, and it, it occurred again. And the, the following morning, there was it wasn't just one or two were walking away with jaws dropped. It was like, <laughs> all of them. And, I must admit, one of the things that interested me was um, the bottle. On, on its edge, on yes. the corner. Um, I've actually had a case that I was brought into. Um, it was someone else's case, and they put, brought me in to, um, to help with that. And we actually had that with a... Um, I think it was like a long... You know the long, tall glasses, the sim glasses that you can get? Yeah. And we actually had the glass tilt on its edge, just like that. Wow! That's fantastic. That, you want to know was, why? Sorry? Sorry. No, I was going to say it. it uh, that, that that's yet again. It's just mm. stereotypical. I don't know if you've read the Contagion book. We did a, a follow-up book, which I'm currently updating at the moment. And we did a, 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 a seemingly unrelated case in Newcastle, mm. where these four girl students lived in their accommodation, and they were having poltergeist like activity. No. When we went over and we did the interviews, one of the girls had seen a bottle of water balancing on its side, but this time it was spinning round. You know? Wow. And in, in our contagion book, yeah. oh, I'll, I'll have to get this, that one. This, this could be another 
interview in itself when when that book's released, perhaps. I mean, it was released in 2014 originally, but I'm updating in it. I'm up, sorry, I'm updating it and adding to it. In yeah, we'd book. love to have you on and talk about that book. Oh, we we um, we've come to the conclusion, or we've we've put this hypothesis forward in relation to the nature of the poltergeist, mm. rather than it being a a bunch of single poltergeists working independently all over the place. It's 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 one super pult or an orc poltergeist. As crazy as that sounds, um, and there's a couple of people within psychical research who are actually like they're reading this book with glee and they're thinking, wow, how come how come yeah. nobody's thought of this before? And we'll, we'll come up with these ideas and theories. And, and that's all it is. It's an idea. It's a oh, theory. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It, it's a really good, interesting concept, actually, yeah. I could, yeah, I could see how that would work. Yes, it's, it's, it's to do with all the, the parallels and the, the striking coincidences. It's like, we'll go into, like, murderers. Say, like, there's a murderer and he's operating in New York and he leaves an, an ace of hearts on somebody's chest. And then another murder occurs and it leaves an ace of hearts on somebody's chest. It's like a calling card. Hmm. And these incidences yeah. are so specific, it leads you to think that like, all these murders are being committed by one person, not a number of people, because people commit murders all the time. Lots of murders, lots of murderers out there. But when when things occur within cases that are so case specific, it, it leads you to, to think: Could this be the same bloody thing? Could yeah. this be the same one poltergeist? Because in the bottle balance footage, we thought was extremely fascinating but then to find another case where the bottle's been held on its edge exactly the same it's, it's demonstrating exactly the same sort of yeah. and, then, and, it's like, well, and then you've just mentioned there with with a, with a glass it's not a bottle but it's a glass but again it's it's standing on its edge mm. and we was all present when that happened but um we didn't actually notice it happening it wasn't yeah. until someone said oh look at that glass it was like oh wow <laughs> Oh wow, well, indeed. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, again, I wasn't there the night that occurred. You know, yeah. There is a film footage which has been submitted to this. There's a website out there called Bad Psychics, and I was quite honoured to have been featured on that website because I'm thinking, well, I must be rattling some cages. There must be. We must be doing something yuff to to get the attention of these people. Because they used to slate the likes of Derek Acora and all the mediums on telly and all the, the programmes. And yeah. I'm thinking, wow, they're slating me up there with them. <laughs> Which I thought was a bit of a backhanded compliment. But anyway, someone had made this video f- film and they had managed to get the bottle, bottle balancing on its side. And, and you can hear this voice saying, well, we've got the bottle and we've put X amount of water in and we've done this and we've done that. And in a very sarcastic sort of tone it's like and lo and behold one poltergeist bottle and when you look at the footage on the website it there's a little acknowledgement to the sender and it says thank you in lefty's initials which i'll refrain from saying <laughs> um because i used to know this chap quite well um anyway but thank you um for explaining to us how the faked the footage and I was, I was like absolutely blown away, gobsmacked. And I've never, never I've been quite hurt in, in, in relation to it. It's like, wow, I thought, I thought you were a friend. Um, but it was never faked. And the only thing is, on this, on what he says, this is how they faked it. And I'm like, well, have you actually read the book at all? Because I actually wasn't there. So I yeah. couldn't have faked anything. I, I was at home when this bottle balance was was filmed you know so 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 when you was actually sort of there you're sort of quite established in the house now you sort of like coming and going uh did you would this entity poltergeist whatever you like to call it did you get to a stage where you could interact with it or was it all random that was going on around you that's a good question, that, and that's one of my regrets, actually, because I wished that we could have done more or attempted more to interact with it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
for example, the knocking. There was knocking and thumping heard in the house, but that, that was in the early days. I wish there'd have been times where, when we were sitting there, we were calling out of it and communicating and saying, give us a knock, give us a knock. And you, maybe you could chat that type of knocking. Mm-hmm. We never actually did that, um, which, is, right. which is one of the things... And they, you know, it's like it's too cringingly embarrassing. It's like, oh my goodness, it's it's one of these things. It's it's like a mistake which you've got to learn from. I've read many other cases where people are like interacting with the poltergeist, and I thought, why, why, why the hell didn't we do that? <laughs> um, well, hindsight's a great thing, isn't it? <laughs> but it did, it did communicate, and it did show uh, a rudimentary intelligence. Um, there was lots of times we were talking about certain things at certain particular times when events occurred which tied into that. Right. I was listening in. There you go. You've been talking about that. Boom. Have that. And then there was there was the text messages that Marianne was getting, um, threatening text messages, death threats, that sort of thing. I will come for you tonight. I'll get you when you're in bed. And it was calling out all sorts of vile names. Don't bother running to your mums. I'll just come with you. All that sort of stuff. And there was one occasion where Mike and Marianne were talking on the phone and she was petrified. And she was saying, Mike, Mike, please tell us this thing can't come with us. And within the space of a, a fraction of a second, the text come through. I am, com- you know, I'm, I can come with you. you you're not going to get any sleep. I'm going to come and kill you tonight. And that's what it was saying. And we basically more or less said, look, it's it's an empty thread. It's a it's a poltergeist. It's just trying to ramp up your fear. I mean, at this particular time, I've got to be honest. I was absolutely terrified myself. I was absolutely terrified. I started leaving my mobile phone at home when these text messages start coming through because I was terrified I was going to start getting them. To be honest, uh, but we basically sort of bit the bullet and said, "Look, it's an empty threat. You've got nothing to be afraid of." hoping that it wasn't going to actually go and kill her. Uh, and it didn't. Um, mm. She went, she got her sleep, and it was just trying to ramp up the fear. So this is where we get the idea from, in the Contagion book, we're talking about the poltergeist feeding off dormant electricity, perhaps feeding off fear, and it generates this fear, so it, so it feeds. So it kind of, this particular poltergeist case for us, although poltergeist cases are all different, this one seemingly was an entity of sorts which had intelligence and it was kind of sentient, if you, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where it came from, we do. there's a theory that it could have built up within the focus, like RS, the, the, the RSPK theory, it builds up within it and then when it can't go any further, it externalizes itself, like, you know, like a t- psychic temper tantrum, is it RSPK? But then, this particular poltergeist seemed to detach itself from the whole, from the, the focus, and then it, it had this life of its own. It, it, it's so, so fascinating and so, so many avenues to go down and think about, and it, it's just, it just fries your brain when, when you think about it. So, so it, it was but, actually texting. Sending it was sending texts text and sending messages. It started off with them. Um, Voice messages first. It would ring. It would ring the landline, um, and when you'd get the message, you'd get this electronic type of voice, which would read whatever the text was that sent. Like, "Hello, how are you?" And you'd, you'd press the button, and yeah. you'd hear this autom- automated voice, "Hello, how are you?" You know, it's like an electronic voice. Well, was right. that was it, that ever looked into? Because, like, when when you obviously send text messages, it normally comes with a. Um, a phone number attached to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it actually came from Mark's phone, oh, which right, was right. sitting on the table in front of her with the SIM card removed and the battery removed as well. Oh, right, okay, so you did all that, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a couple of messages which came before that, and we thought, well, this has come from Mark's phone, so everybody got their phones out on the table. So, right, everybody get your phone on the table. We want to see these phones. Mm. And Mike had a look into it to see if it could be pre-programmed to send text, because we thought... Could this be Mark sending text to to, oh. to ramp the f- whatever up? You know, to, to yeah, keep it to be going. honest, that would, that would be my fish, uh, initial thought. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah that's, that's what we thought. So we had them all put the, the, the mobiles out on the table, 
and the, the landline was put on the table and, and we're sitting discussing what was going on and then beep, 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 the phone went again and she got another text message and, and we, were, we were sitting looking at the phone on the table when it came through. So that's when we decided, right, we, we took it to pieces and put it on the table and then more messages came through. Um, again, it was like sitting there looking at each other going, what? What on earth is going on? And there, there was one point in the investigation where I was genuinely really like, oh my God, just what is it that we are dealing with here? You know, and I, I could feel like my guts churning and I'm thinking, this is, God, this is bad, this. So when Mark realised it, well, when you all realised it was actually coming from Mark's phone mm-hmm. to his partner, what was his reaction when you realised that that's the source of those texts? Well, do you know what it is? Mark's a funny character. Or he, he was a funny character. He he was, in a way, he was a bit like Robert. He was just not bothered at all. He, I mean, the, the person that was frightened the most was Marianne. She was mm. beside herself. She needs a medal, that woman, for, for going through what she went through. Um, but Mark, Mark was like, things were occurring, and he was just like, shrugging his shoulders and, and like not laughing but he just found it <sighs> there's not a word I can I can find he was just like yeah what something else you know just kind of giggling at it um, did that not send alarm bells because this could I'm not saying it is and you know I, I it's a genuine case but mm-hmm. at this point you, you kind of are starting to think maybe it's some form of narcissistic abuse against Marianne to keep her under control. A very um, toxic relationship between Mark and Marianne. It's coming from his phone to her phone. It's instilling fear. She's going to rely on him more. It's a very narcissistic kind of relationship sounding. Um, I would be horrified, must, personally, if, if I was in that situation. It came from my phone to somebody else's. I'd be like, oh, my God, I promise you I never said that. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's, uh, no, no, no. Um but to laugh that off, not seeing the effect it's having on his partner. Yeah. Well, I don't think he was laughing it off in an evil way. I think it was, he was laughing it off as it was like sort of water off a duck's back. He wasn't particularly... Not, I mean, he was bothered, but he wasn't... He found it all quite bemusing, if you know what I mean. Um, in relation to alarm bells ringing alarm bells were ringing from day one as soon as we started witnessing stuff we were constantly on my guard anyway looking out we, we were we were itching to catch somebody out you know dying to catch somebody out but not once through the whole episode did we ever see anybody or catch anybody faking anything which brings me to an event that occurred one day the three there was myself Mike and this lady who Mike had knew we went along um, to the house and she was going to try and see if she could pick anything up she, she claimed to be psychic so we thought we'll bring her along see what she says and on that day in question we decided that we were going to sit the family down and ask them if they were engaging in all out fraud had they somehow duped us to the point where you know like because there was things we had still seen at this point which when you, they couldn't have done, you know? So even oh. if they did carry out one or two acts, which I have to stress, we never caught them doing that. Even if they did, there was other things that we seen which highlighted the fact that this case was genuine. There's things that they couldn't possibly have done that, that we had witnessed. Anyway, we had a sweep of the house when we got there and we went upstairs and we walked into the bedroom and on the table... There was um, two cuddly toys, a rabbit and a duck. There's a photograph illustrated in the book. And it was situated in this certain pose. And there was this, like, it must have been like an eight-inch or nine-inch carving knife. Huge kitchen knife lying over the neck of the duck, I think it is. Whereas the other cuddly toy was, like, as if it was, like, cutting its, cutting its throat. Mm. And me and mate were like, oh, my goodness gracious me what the so anyway in a nutshell we turned around and said look this is too far this is just getting too ridiculously cheesy I mean this was before the cuts I have to, have to add as well 
So we decided to sit them down. I looked at Mike knowing me, and he looked at Mike, and we thought, ah, we're going to have to pull up about this again. So we sat them down at the table, and we said, look, that's just a, a, a cheesy setup, that. We said, it's for, to the best of our knowledge, we we were, we were scouting the house, and in, 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 in it wasn't in that position, sort of thing. So, And then the next time we went to the room, it was. So we sat them down, and we said, look, are you engaging in, in fraud yet? Because you've got to understand, from our perspective, I mean, it's horrendous, that. That is horrendous. And if, if somebody's faking that to do ramp up the fear for whatever reason, that's just, you know, it's just bleh, not good. Yeah, it's too far. And that, yeah, at that point, Marianne started weeping, started getting a bit upset because they thought, well, we're just going to leave and think, mm. no, we're not having this. But we didn't. We said, look, we said we'd stay with you to the end. We would not cut and run regardless of what happens. We'd, we'd get this resolved whatever way. Whether there's someone pranking or whether it's a genuine part against them, we'll get it sorted and then you can know what's going on. So as the day progressed, there was a number of incidences that occurred which me and Mike saw, as well as this other lady, Mark and Marianne were in the same room as well as these things occurred. And it was like... It was as though the poltergeist had been listening into our conversation and as we were not accusing them, but we were asking them, look, is there some sort of trickery going on here? Are you taking the mick here? It was as if the poltergeist was listening in and thinking, right, I'm not going to let him take credit for my handiwork. So it then went on to display a number of feats which proved beyond all doubt Mark wasn't faking it mm-hmm. or Marianne wasn't faking it anything like that um, things being thrown around there was these blue building blocks big huge block things which were in Robert's room upstairs and when we were all downstairs in the kitchen there was a big glass sliding door which led out into the into the yard now I was looking towards the door at the time and I seen like these building blocks just fall down in front of the window and clatter on, on the pavement stones outside and we were like well there's nobody upstairs them building blocks were upstairs in Robert's room because they were his toys everybody's downstairs so who th- who threw the, the Lego blocks out the window but not only that the window was actually closed and locked the blades were down and the curtains were closed so whatever happened there these blocks must have went through the window through the curtains through the blades and dropped outside which was a good example of one of the many examples of matter through matter, which we experienced there as well. So in relation to into, into Mark potentially trying to control Marianne with what you, what you had suggested before, I would, I would, yeah, no, I would say it's definitely out of, out of the question. And although he laughed it off, it was like more like, it was like a, a a scared sort of laughter, like, <laughs> you know, an incredulous it, it's hard to explain. Mm. It's hard to explain, but yeah. th- th- there's no indication at all that Mark was anything other than the poltergeist victim, as, as well as Marianne and, and Robert. So, okay. Uh, did the poltergeist ever give itself a name or, a, um, you know, did it identify itself? In the early days, yes. Um, Robert seemed to have had an imaginary friend who we seen on a number of occasions um, who identified himself as Sammy. Now, Mike had just recently written a book on imaginary childhood friends. Um, so he he was sort of lowered down the imaginary childhood friend road, whereas I wasn't convinced. I thought, if this is a poltergeist, it's masquerading is a number of things trying to confuse with, if you know what I mean, which which it, it kind of did because it got me and Mike not arguing, but it got me in heated discussions about what was potentially going on. But not heated discussions, it's just like debates, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, uh, we have them on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, Mike was, con- Mike was convinced that 
what Robert was saying and what was responsible for certain activity in certain areas of the house, namely his bedroom, was down to his imaginary childhood friend, which Mike was arguing isn't actually imaginary. It's a real sort of entity type thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I was like, no, Mike, I'm, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not convinced. I think it's just the poltergeist because there's other poltergeist cases which come with what I'd called at that time accompanying apparitions. That actually, they've actually been termed um, intermediate poltergeist cases um, in Golden Cornell's 1979 book about poltergeists. But I wasn't aware of that terminology at the time. I just said some poltergeists come with accompanying apparitions where it kind of, poltergeists and ghosts kind of like cross over, if, if you know what I mean. Mm, um, kind of links into Guy Leon Playfair's kind of explanation as well of, of this ball of energy that is sent out and then various entities come along <laughs> and play with that and then off the back of that, the energy bursts and, and then you get poltergeist activity. And yeah. he kind of toys with that idea, doesn't he? Yes, it's it's quite a, a fascinating idea. Um, but again, I think Guy had said it's it's basically he was fumbling around in the dark, like 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 we all are, and it's like it's it's just an idea. Perhaps it could be this and could be that. But yeah. because he had he's he had experienced so many poltergeists in other cases, not just the Enfield. He, he you know the guy was he, he knew what he was talking about, and he come up with some good ideas and theories as, as, as to how these things could be doing. But the, the, the fact was, he'd experienced cases where even doppelgangers were seen. I do believe there was a doppelganger out of Morris Gross seen at Enfield when, when he wasn't even there. Yeah. Um, and there was mm-hmm. other, there's other cases where apparitions have been seen in poltergeist infected houses. And there's like a fine line between a haunting and a poltergeist or, or like, or the, you know, like the stereotypical Castle type haunting and it, it, it it's it kind of oh it it's graze it, it graze everything up. Does that does that make sense? And it, it's hard mm-hmm. to distinguish what type of activity is being executed by what type of entity or, or poltergeist or whatever. But I I was I was adamant that the thing itself shields was just the one poltergeist and it was just displaying itself or it was coming across in other forms. To confuse, to to get to get were mixed up, to throw off the scent or whatever it was. Now, in the early days, yes, it identified itself as Robert's playmate, which which was Sammy. But then later on, things got a lot more sinister, and it started messing with Robert by moving him around and doing things. And we're thinking, well, if it's if it's his friend, why why would it do? It? And I'm saying, make it's a poltergeist. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced it's just the one thing we're dealing with one paranormal phenomenon yeah it's the poltergeist and it's just playing with your head whatever it is and I think Meg eventually came round I think it's mentioned in the book Meg, Meg actually come round to the idea that I was right and he was he was wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which I take no great sort of pride in but it, it, creased, it created some debate and it, it just added to the whole mystery of the investigation. But yes, in the early days, to answer your question, it identified itself as a youngster called Sammy. See, this is why I, I, I think back and I wish, yes, we made mistakes in the things we could have done better, but it's all part of the learning. I don't know if I'll ever get a case like this again. If I, if I do, there's things I'll probably do different next time round. I'm trying to get more communication out of it i.e. in the form of bangs and raps. We did get bangs and raps, we've recorded a few, but we'd love to have like engaged in some sort of communication with it to find out what it is. Or oh, wow. How long did this, this um, poltergeist activity last? Or was it still ongoing? No, um, it finished in the November of 2006 or thereabouts and started in the December of 2005 so it was almost 12 months that this thing okay. um, sort of went, went on for and just like the case in Enfield towards the end of the case it petered out from the house for a while and then it came back for a week with a vengeance and then gone just, it just went 
So yeah. you didn't do any house clearances, you didn't get an exorcism in, you didn't get, um, you know, you didn't do any of that. It just no, no, the, went the, on its own. The, the, there was a, a ritual sort of carried out, and that was that was done under Mike. At that time, Mike was into his, um, he, well, he, he's always been sort of Native American spiritualism, that sort of thing. And he, he, he said he had family that's sort of, you know, he's, some of his descendants were like Native Americans and stuff. And he was into the Native American stuff, and he had this idea of potentially quelling it, or at least trying to control it in some way. You know, there's a, bit, there's a little bit of debate, a little bit of controversy as to how how far we should get involved, whether we should just stay back as observers or just get involved and try to, re- to remove this thing. You now, to be honest, they were desperate at that point. And I think Mike had just basically said, look, there's two things we can do. We can sit back, we'll sit back with you and we can ride it out because it will come to an end or we can try and smudge it and quell it and, and do it. He said, but we've got to be honest, Mike had said, you know, the best thing to do is to just sit back and let it burn itself out. Mm. But we gave the family the opportunity. We weren't going to hold anything back. We were going to tell them, we are going to be truthful with them all the time. So we basically said, look, he has your, he has your choices. And they jumped at it. They basically said, look, give it a go. Give it a go. Please, we're desperate. Try and smudge this thing out. See what you can do in an attempt. So I have to make that clear. It was done, not because we thought we were going to go in and rid the poltergeist, because deep down in my mind, I was thinking, you can't, you've got to let it burn itself out. Mm. But there's other people that disagree with me in relation to how to deal with poltergeists. So they wanted, uh, well, they wanted Mike to do the, the smudging. So he got his sage and sweet grass, and he went around the house and he'd done the ceremony. And yes, it quelled it for a short while, but as per usual, it came back with a vengeance and it, it, and it just tore the place apart it trashed the rooms it turned them upside down it it, it, it was as if it was seriously angry of, of what Mike had done that's what it seemed at the time and on one of the other occasions where, where Mark was cut on a night that was called Grim Saturday that was where everybody had came round I, I had this team of colleagues researchers who, who I used to go investigating with I got, got them all in with Mark and Marianne's permission. And we said, look, things are kicking off left, right and centre here. We need more people in, to, you know, for witness testimony. We need more cameras in. We need to get as much evidence or as much documentation of this as possible. So where everybody went in, there's a colleague of Mike's. Um, it's been a long time since I've said his name. I can't quite remember what it is. His name's in the book. He was also a Native American type of guy. So they came in and they carried out this this ritual that created what was called a medicine wheel. Mm -hmm. Um, And they they carried out this ritual to try and smudge it. Because after the first smudging, it came back and it started cutting Mark. So they wanted wanted Mark protected. So this was all new to me as well, I've got to be honest. And I was watching with bated breath and I was also watching with great interest, thinking... Wow, what's going on here? Anyway, we had this smudging ceremony, and that was one of the nights where Mark was was actually cut again. They'd, they'd done the smudging ceremony. Um, Mark was standing outside this circle that they'd created, um, and Mike had said, "No, once this thing kind of works out, what we're trying to do here, it's going to be absolutely furious, and it's and it's going to lash out." And we think the, that Mark was the focus here, so with stands to reason that. Mark was going to bear the brunt of this and he did so when it started attacking Mark the idea was Mark was to step inside this protection circle which the Native Americans called the medicine wheel and it would then protect them from it mm-hmm. but it, it's all it's all complicated stuff I don't know much about the medicine wheel and the Native American spirituality type thing but what I do know is what I what I saw on that night is that it did go for him and he was cut to pieces and when he stepped inside, as soon as he stepped inside this circle, the cut stopped and then they disappeared. Now, you can look at it one of two ways. You can think, well, the medicine wheel worked and there was something spiritual going on, or the whole thing was psychosomatic. And because he stepped inside that circle and he thought to himself, I'm now safe, 
whatever was going on within his psyche that was producing this phenomena made him stop it, if you know what I mean. So it was like yeah. a psychosomatic thing. I, I've was, always, yeah, I've always thought that that sort of stuff is psychosomatic because even I, I've seen mediums do protection in so many different ways. It's almost, yeah. for me, brainwashing someone to believe that they're protected. And once their mind, their mindset is, I'm protected, I'm strong, I've got protection, you ain't coming in sort of thing. And once they've got that attitude, that protects them. Yeah. So I've always, I've always thought that. Yeah. Well, like I say, though, on, 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 the, on, that, on that night, I was, and this, this was Mike's thing, if you know what I mean, Mike's sort mm. of idea, Mike had said it to them, preferably, both Mike and I wanted to not carry out any type of ritual of sorts, but we were just prepared to sit and wait it out with them and wait for it to disappear, which we believe it was going to eventually. But even Mike and I were asking ourselves, just when is this going to go? If, if this is outstaying, it's welcome way too long. And we thought, it, it's got to... But then when you look at other poltergeist cases... Yes, they're short-lived normally, but there are cases that go on for two years, three years. The case in 1996, mm. investigated by John and Ann Spencer, went on for about five or six years in total, which which is horrendous. Um, so it, it, it kind of... It, it's just, it's just mind-blowing, the whole thing. But again, after the medicine wheel scenario, Grim Saturday night was carried out, it quietened down for a while, and again, it, it just came back. And so I just more or less said to Mike, look, you know, we've tried the, we've tried the smudging. They wanted you to tr- they wanted you to do. You give them the options. They chose an option, so we went with it. Um, we were just doing what we could to the best of our ability to try and help this poor family, hmm. you know. But even even while the ritual in the the smudging ceremony that night has been subject to a little bit of controversy, which which is fair fair enough, you know. Um, but because there was two main investigators, we both had different ideas. So we were throwing these ideas about. I didn't want to step on Mike's toes and say, you're not doing that, because I'm, I was open-minded to it. And I thought, well, maybe it might work. We've, I think we've got to try everything in my power to try and bring this thing to its knees, as cheesy as that sounds. And eventually, eventually... You could say we did, but on reflection, yeah, I had a, a, a change of thought. I think to myself, well, maybe it did just naturally burn itself out just at that coincidental time where the family were told to turn off all that electrical goods and starve it of its food, i.e. the, the dormant electricity that was being held in the, in the hi-fis and the machines. Um, a college, a, a university professor, a friend of ours, he had said, he thought to give her that idea, get them to turn off all the gear, you know, because there could be yeah. dormant electricity. So we tried it, and it seemed to like quell the activity massively. But then the thought occurs: well, maybe that was just a coincidence. Who knows? I'm open minded. Perhaps we did something right, and we did manage to beat this thing, or perhaps it was just purely coincidence, and it just fizzled out, burnt itself out all by itself, because it really should have burnt itself out technically in our minds a long time before that, mm. and it didn't. So maybe it was just coincidence. Is it more questions than answers, as always? Always, <laughs> always with the paranormal. Yeah. So going into the aftermath, once it's resolved to a degree um, and the family settled down and then no, no more activity, mm-hmm. where, how, how long after did you follow up with that once the activity ceased? Um, December 2005 to nearly November 2006. The book was published in 2008, and it wasn't long after when the book came out. They decided that they wanted to be anonymous. They, they did want to put their names in at first, but then they had a change of heart, which which is fair enough. And then they had decided at that point, look, we just want to forget the whole thing. It's all. It would have been about a year or so afterwards we were kind of in touch. And then the book came out, and then they decided. I think they got a bit frightened, and they thought they don't want to. They don't want to have to deal with vicious, nasty attack 
people calling them liars when they know they're not. So they decided to like just keep out the way, keep their heads down, and they wanted nothing more to do with it, the case, the whole thing. And with respect to them, we said, fine. We, we went our separate. We, we went our actual separate ways. And to my knowledge, to this day, they're, they're still doing fine, and everything's tickety boo, and there's no more ghostly activity. And it's, I wish them absolute luck, and, and I wish them well. I mm. really do. Do they actually still live in the same house? Well, that is something I don't know, to be honest, because okay. obviously we, we went by separate ways. Um, I couldn't actually say if they do or they don't. I have a funny feeling they might not. I think they might have sold up because it was actually their house. They were buying it. They right. had a mortgage on it. Um, contrary to a lot of slagging off that they received via. They didn't receive it, but we we took the brunt of... Yeah. We took the yeah. brunt of the, 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 the slating that it got. And they, were, they were called liars and they were called cheats and they were called money-making fraudsters. And so were we. Um, and... I didn't deal with that very well, to be honest, back in the day. Now, I really don't give two hoots what people think. Back in the day, you could have had us in a straight jacket and off to the nearest mental institute. It drove me potty because I knew we were telling the truth. Um, and I think what the family might have decided to do was because they just wanted to forget the whole sordid affair, they might have sold up and they might have moved to get yeah. a new house. Yeah, and, no, that and, would make sense. Sort of yeah, yeah that's what I'm, I'm, I'm 100% unsure of what it is they did we just every step of the way they were the boss what they did what we wanted to do everything went through them if they didn't want us to do anything we wouldn't do anything we had to ask to have people involved we had to ask for or Dave Wood and Nicky to come up we had, we, you know everything went through them first and if any, if they disagreed with anything we did or they didn't like anything we were doing we told them to tell it and we wouldn't do it so they oh, were that, that's the way to do it, isn't it, really? Yeah, I yeah. agree. They were the bosses all the way. And um, that's that's it. The, okay, the, let's. Was, yeah. that's not the right. only thing you've done. So I want to quickly move on from the South Shields. But before we do, where can people find your account, the book, The South Shields Poltergeist? Right, well, the best place to get it is where everybody does that shopping now, and that'll be on Amazon. Um, Amazon.co.uk. Just type in Darren W. Ritson or the South Shields Poltergeist, and it'll come up. And I would recommend if anybody gets it, um, let's say collectors may want to get the hardback or the, or the first editions, but the new third edition with the black and white cover with the chairs on the front, that's the best place to get it. Or you can get it anywhere shopping online WH Smith's, Waterstones, um, all good bookshops, things like that that's where you can get your hands on it, basically. I highly recommend anybody who doesn't know this case gets this book because what we've we've literally skirted the outline of this case. Mm. Believe it or not, I know it feels like we've done a lot of in-depth, but we haven't. We really haven't <laughs> <laughs> on this case. You need to get the full account um, and read read the account for yourselves because literally it is the, one of the most mind-blowing cases I think I've read, um, the detail that's in it um, is definitely on a par with the Enfield Poltergeist. So, guys, definitely recommend that that one. Now, uh, moving on. It's not the only book you've written. (laughs) You've written quite a few. (laughs) Yes, yes. um, I think I'm on to uh, 18 or 19 books I think I've done. Uh, We've got Um, a way to catch up then. Which I'm, I'm very proud about. A lot of them... A lot of them, I have to say, some of my early books are absolute rubbish. Can I just say that now? Um, you know, you live and you learn and you, you move on and then you look back at your early stuff and you think, oh, my goodness me. Yeah. It's like In Search of Ghosts, the, the the first version, the black and white version that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And there's a, ver- there's a book called Ghost Hunter, which I would not recommend to anybody. So if, you, if you're going to get any of my books, do not get them because you'll see what, a, what an illiterate... <laughs> fool I was because <laughs> oh, it's God. littered with mistakes and there was no proofreader uh, however those two books were published again with a regular publisher I self-published the first two um, and I think it was Ambly Publishers they they did 
they redid In Search of Ghosts. They give it a yeah. whole and I corrected all my mistakes and added a few little bits and bats. And that's a little bit better than the first one. But Ghost Hunter um, was released as Paranormal Northeast. And I've re-edited that and took all the, the rubbish. So they're, they're the books you should get if you want to read the, the proper versions of the first two. But yeah. I've done a few regional guides as well, you know, like in the Haunted series. Um, Haunted Newcastle, Haunted Tain and Weir, and the Haunted Berwick, Durham. Um, uh, that kind of thing. I don't know, <laughs> Paranormal County Durham. Uh, Haunted Durham. They're regional guides. They're, they're easy to throw together. 40,000 words is just a piece of cake when there's so much interesting history and ghost mm. stories out there. So when you're when you're looking at your regional guides, um, you know the regional ghost stories and stuff. Do you actually delve deep into the history? Well, how do you develop that? Well, first of all, I used to just make a list of all the haunted places that I could think of in those areas. Um, then, I, then I would try to like space them out. So because I didn't really want to write a, a full book on Durham, say for example, if everything's all based around the market square, I had to space things out so it, it gives a good variation of the city, if you know what I mean. Um, and basically I would just, I would look online, I would read the stories, I would look in other books, I would, I would research other books, and obviously I'd quote all my sources and references. And then once I've got a nice bit of information, I would say, right, I'm, I'm off, I'm off over to visit these places. And if it's a pub, for example, um, like uh, the Shakespeare Tavern, that's a fantastic little place in County Durham. Um, tiny little pub, but that's got to go. I decided to actually go there, and I went in and I bought myself a paint, and I started asking the landlord about the ghosts, and, and I ended up getting little tours of the, a lot of these places. And there were a lot of them were like happy to be, be included in these books because obviously they thought it was good publicity for them, you know. And I only went to places where had reputations of being haunted, rather than going to places where have you got a ghost? Although I did do that. Um, I'd be very careful what to write up, and I'd have to be sure that they're telling the truth before I was. I put them in the book because I'd hate to think like I was being fed a, a, a crock of rubbish just to put in a book just to give them some free publicity. I genuinely wanted good ghost stories from these places, so a lot of the times I would go and visit the places themselves, and, which was great because I like, see I got tours and I got to talk to people, and then uh, you know for example. Uh, the owner of um, Crook Hall, um, which was another fabulous little place in Durham, um, they were saying, well, yes, we've had experience. Oh, you want to talk to the cleaner? Oh, you should talk to such and such. And then I'd get contact numbers and talk to them, and it would just fill up. And the nine times out of ten, I'd end up with 60,000 words, and I've I've got 20,000 words I need to get rid of. So I then had to spend time editing it down. So, I'm going to have to get that book, because my nan's from County Durham. It'd be interesting Ooh, to find out the well areas. Yeah, Crook Hall's a fabulous little place. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I've been there like, once. That, that was just a fleeting visit on the way up to Scotland. I think we stopped right. over at Canada, Durham. Yeah. And was it? And, and did you see? Did you see the white lady there coming down the staircase? By um, no, no. To be uh, there, we just crashed at the hotel. By the time we found it, it was like really late. So we just. Yeah. I think it was the the night the first episode of Doctor Who with Peter Capaldi was on. Oh, so right. we watched that in the hotel room and then crashed out because we had to start again at 6 o'clock the next morning. <laughs> We've gone through nearly a whole show without you referencing Doctor well, Who. Yeah. You pop it never, in there never in the gonna last happen. 10 minutes. Never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, me. my God. <laughs> Some things don't change. They certainly don't. So you, you're predominantly up north. Yep. Are you thinking more coming south at any point? Um, maybe, yeah, if coronavirus allows. I have been down that way before, of course. Um, make me in search of ghosts, but that's that was uh, my supernatural north. Well, no, that's not really south, is it? No, my supernatural north book covers the whole of the north of England, and I'll, I'll like stop at the borders if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. In search of ghosts is more the whole of the United Kingdom. Then I came down to Devon, and I. Uh, to Cornwall and I went to London and different places Norfolk and then up to Scotland and stuff like that so mm. I do I did get around I've done a, a fair bit of travelling around the, 
the UK. But yes, I'd, I'd love to come back down south again. In fact, Cornwall and Devon or one or two places I would, I would like to explore a lot Oz, more. Oz Castle is really nice in... Oh, I was thinking more Essex. <laughs> yeah. No, Essex. Yes, I've been down to Essex, of course, and um, I did a nice... I did a great weekend in Essex when we, we came camping, and the, the main purpose for that trip was to visit the site of Bawley Rectory, mm-hmm. which, yeah. which we did. We spent a couple of days up there in the churchyard and just looking around, not making pests of myself, but just being a you know I wasn't you know there's a lot of people they, they, they could probably get sick of visit as over the years so you've got to be very respectful but the guy parked up in the car and I, I, I walked all the way up the lane just to keep a low profile and I took some but I got talking to the lady who lives in the, the coach house that still stands and uh, she was telling us what a whole load of rubbish it was and I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking she's that's just sick to death of people really going there aren't they? and they're like no no it was all rubbish it was all poo poo Bye bye, don't come back. You know, yeah. give us a loan, please. But um, yeah, I, well, that, that was a good weekend there. And we went to Clacton on Sea and we had a look around. There's a castle down there, I can't think what it's called, in, around that area. But we went to that castle for the day. I can't remember what it's called. But that's that's all in the In Search of Ghost School as well. So um, I've, done a, I've done a fair bit of travelling around. Yeah, again, it's all inspirational by, by the likes of Peter Underwood. He, he got everywhere and he. He started off these gazetteers of ghosts, A to Zs of haunted places, and mm. I thought, wow, that's great. I want to visit places and talk to people, and I, I just love going to spooky old pubs and castles and walking down that old creaky corridors, and just you just don't know who's going to glide through the wall, perhaps, or come round the corner, or you know, and talking to people and interviewing them and finding out first-hand accounts of these wonderful tales. It's just, it's just fantastic. I couldn't imagine doing anything else apart from mountain climbing. I like mountain climbing, but even then, even then, there's spooky mountains in the Lake District, which I'm considering writing up about. I'm three quarters of the way through uh, a Cumbria in Lake District book, which I, I need to resume. But then, because I'm carrying out a 214 Wainwright challenge, I don't know if you know what that is. There's there's 214 mountain tops. Which okay. Alfred Wainwright sort of listed in his seven pictorial guides, and it's like the Munros in Scotland. You know, you, you, you're hiking and you're climbing these mountains. You, I want to do all 214, and I've I've done 132. I think I've got 80 odd left to go, wow. um, which has kept us nice and trim. And I've had some fantastic adventures. You know, climbing up cliff faces and getting to the tops of these things above the clouds at sunrise, all that sort of stuff. But then I found out there's a couple of the tops. That have got legends attached to them, like Scorfeld Pike, it's supposed to be a ghost at the top of that. Um, Great Gable, which is a male sort of northeast, I think. There's a ghost on the top of that. Suit I fell, there's an army of soldiers set to walk across the top. And a couple of hundred years ago, they were seen like three nights in a row, things like that. And then you've got like the old coffin routes that take you from valley to valley. You don't go over the tops, you just go through these trails and there's this coffin routes. And, the stories in relation to like ghostly carriages, and so there's a fair bit on that I could, that I could write up on, and I could get that book finished, and then I can include some pictures of me on my beloved fells as well. So that's like kind of combining two passions, I suppose, me ghosts and me and me mountains as well. So, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> so, where's the first place you're gonna when you're released? When we're all released? Um, yeah. from lockdown and we're allowed to travel further afield or closer to home whatever your floats your boat what's first yeah. on your bucket list? Well believe it or not I'm going to go straight back to the Lake District and continue with me with me wind riding I've, I've got 82 left to do I want to be one of these completers I know that's not ghostly related but in relation to the last book that I was telling you about about the Lake District in Cumbria mm-hmm. I could combine my passion. There's a couple of areas of interest where I need to get some photographs to go with the book. Like, say, for example, I could go blend Catherine again and, and see the top of suit I felt, because you get a nice view across, looking down over the, the summit. Of, mm. I can get some pictures of that. So I'll probably go back to the lakes when I'm free, and then what I'll do is I'll tie up one goal whilst tying up another, if you know what I mean. I'll get me photographs. I'll get me stories from the the. Yeah, it's going to be the Lake District. 
Cool. And before we before we wrap this show up, if people want to get in contact with any of their own personal stories or find your books anywhere, where can they find you, Darren? They can find me. Well, I'm on Facebook, um, Darren W. Ritson, with that little dot. <laughs> Don't forget the dot, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's where the normal friend is. I don't do Twitter or I don't do Instagram or anything like that. It's just Facebook. And I've got an email address, and that's darren.ritson16, as in 16, at gmail.com. I just go over that again. Darren.ritson, R I T S O N, 16 at gmail.com. That's, that's my contact email. So um, if anyone's got any fantastic Poltergeist cases, who are you going to call? They're going to call us that? first. Did They'll I just call us first. <laughs> yeah, call us first. I can't believe I just said that. We never mind, but yeah. yeah. Any, interesting, any interesting stories, any accounts, because I collect them all, and I, I fail them away, and I may use them one day in another book. Who knows? So and where can they find book. your books? Sorry? To, tell everybody where they can get your books again. Oh, my books. Amazon.com. Um, oh, Amazon.co.uk, sorry. Um, Amazon, Waterstones, WH Smiths, all good bookstores. WH Smiths, Waterstones, yeah, but most people get them from Amazon. Um, that's where most people shop nowadays, doing it online, especially with these lockdowns and that. No, nobody's out and about shopping these days, so go online and get it from Amazon. That's where you'll get it. Awesome. On that note, I'd like to say thank you so much for coming on to the Paranormal Concept Show. It's been an absolute pleasure thank you having, for having you on, me. and we're definitely going to have you back. Oh, that's brilliant. I look forward to that. Definitely. Right. We'll we need you to come back to when you um, do your next book, when you re-release that. <laughs> yeah, Contagion, Contagion yeah. 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 Give us the exclusive. Yes. <laughs> we I'll insist that. upon that. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, any last words? Anything you'd like to add in at this point? Um, no, other than, other than thanks for joining us tonight. It's absolutely brilliant. And I'm really looking forward to reading the rest of the book. Well, I hope yeah, you well, Thank you very much. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, it'll certainly be in my Amazon basket before the day is out. <laughs> much appreciated. That's very much appreciated. And what I would ask people to do is, is, if they have got copies of the books, just put them on your shelf when you're finished and look after them and treasure them because I'm a big book lover. And I think... Yeah in years yeah. time I would like to think that copies of these books are still around for other genera- new generations to read about like I was talking about earlier this is that's more important to me than any royalties the more books that sell the more chance that in 50 years down the lane there's going to be some of my work still floating about and people can actually access it and still read it and then I, it, it goes a little way to, to be able to say I've made a bit of a con- contribution and you know when I'm long gone it'll be great to think that people are still reading about this case or contagion or about the work that I've done mm. that's that's really cool I'm sure yeah. I'm uh, sure especially it will be. If, if you are a big book lover we also have our book out there available <laughs> on Amazon just want to point that out <laughs> Param- <laughs> Paranormal Concept Extra so definitely buy that one for your bookshelves too yes uh, if you go over to our website, paranormalconcept.com, then you can find links to all of our past shows, all of our books, all of our blogs that we write, all of that sort of thing. Anyway, Especially on that note, yeah, on that note, we've got to say goodbye now because we're running over and slap wrists on from the network on that one. But thank you again, Darren, and no say goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>